local city government has a Facebook page and like, or they're doing a market or something, you might want to tag them in it. Or if you follow online publications or newspapers and things like that, like tagging those pages in your posts is one way to get more people to see them, basically. So then, did the best and then I decide okay these three posts did the best so now next month I'm going to create similar content to that um and what did the best is like how many people did it reach but really more how many people interacted with the post because the post could have, have reached um you know 500 people but if there's 10 comments on it there was a lot of interaction on that post and so people were finding value in it which like a lot of people might see it but there was no interaction and they're not necessarily going to bring value so just, these are some of the questions that i would kind of start to ask myself and then i said this was more like shares and comments would be the two main things that i would really want to be getting out of people <laughs> This is another example. So this is an example, uh, an example of how you can use posts to um, like take advantage of things that are happening in your area, kind of, and then capitalize on that. So during the Iowa State Fair, I did this post, like tagged the State Fair. I think in another year, I like had the location as being at the Iowa State Fair, but we weren't at the Iowa State Fair. Basically, I was trying to get people to think about like okay, you like to go to the state fair and maybe you get cheese curds. We have this producer that sells these fried cheese curds year round. Um, so like you might have in the community that you live in, there might be like a festival or something going on. You might tag that page. Um, or recently there's been a lot of these things like National Ag Day. Um, this month is Women's Month. Uh, International Women's Day. I'm obviously thinking a lot about that because of my job, but um, there's just basically different things that you can take advantage of because there's already a conversation happening about them online. There's tons of people talking about being at the Iowa State Fair, so a lot more people will see this post because I'm just basically capitalizing on something that's already happening. So that's something that you can use to um, take, take advantage of, of a resource that's already happening. And then this is another example of a post that did really well. So this was a post, it was a New York Times article. It was getting shared all over Facebook. So because there's a lot of conversation happening about that article already, it's going to be more likely to go higher up in the newsfeed. We had a producer that was in the article and they were featured. So I just pulled the comment, the quote out, and this post did very well. It was like shared quite a few times. And um, so this is just an example of like, if there's a, uh, post or like an article or something that is getting a lot of traction on Facebook, how can you take that post, that article that's already getting a lot of conversation and spin it so that it's applicable to your business? And that's going to be a way that you're going to get more higher up in the news feed. Um, Okay, so that's a little bit about kind of the data and analytics side of things. We talked a little bit about email marketing, and that's going to look different depending on what um, platform you're using. But we've talked about open rate is a big one that we've already talked about. All right, where's my eraser? Oh, right there. Like I said, the open rate is important if you are, especially, um, you know, if you have, like, important information in your email that you need people to read the email to get, you want to look at your open rate. And you're exactly right, 30% is where we start to be considered in, like, good open rate territory. It depends on, I think in food, it's a little less than that. Actually, it's like 25, but about 30% is like a really good open rate. 100% is amazing. 
100% means that you really know what your audience wants and you're delivering it. So like that would be obviously best case scenario. The bigger your email list is, the smaller your open rate's gonna be, um, typically. And then also, like kind of what we talked about earlier is that you have to think about like, what is the information that I'm communicating? So, if I, if all I need people to know is that my like farm retail center is gonna be open for the first time or whatever on this day, the open rate might not be as important as just like making sure that that email gets sent out and that they see it in their inbox. And then the other thing that we always wanna pay attention to is click through rates. And this is how you can start to um, really track like what's effective content. So uh, the click-through rates is basically just the number of times that people have clicked on specific links in your email. And that's where I would, if I'm sending out an email that has five different links in it, and I see that 10 people clicked on one link and nobody clicked on four of the other links, then I'm probably going to spend more time trying to make the things that the make, make the thing that everybody clicked on than I am not. That's like basic concept, but not something that we always think about. Sometimes we're just like focusing on sending the emails out and we're not really paying attention to what people are clicking on. And sometimes we don't necessarily need people to click on a link either in our email. So another thing that you can look at depending on the platform you're using is how much time people are spending looking at your email. So if somebody just like opened it up and closed it, sometimes you can see that that's just, they basically didn't read the email kind of. Um, and I think you can do that in MailChimp, which is why I personally use. Um, so that's kind of what you would want to be looking at with uh, email in terms of like figuring out what's effective or not. And then with Instagram, it's kind of the other thing that we've been talking a lot about I would measure Instagram effectiveness essentially on likes, if I'm building my following or if I'm not building my following. Um, and then if I'm trying to like run some kind of campaign where I'm collecting content or using a hashtag, are people actually using that hashtag or not? And like, why not? Um, and this kind of goes back to that like growth, um, growth hacking funnel that we, I showed at the beginning. Um, so what you use the analytics to is figure out where you're losing people. So like where's the tipping off point where something that you posted didn't make sense. So for an example, at Women, Food and Agriculture Network, we're a network, so we're really trying to like build conversation between women who are in our network. So one of the things that I have done a lot is making uh, an image that has a basic question on it, like where do you order your seeds from? Or like what is your biggest barrier in land acquisition? And some of those questions I get tons of responses to, and some of them it's just like, no one, no one has an answer to this question. Mm -hmm. And so then I know, because I have been testing my content over time, that the question meme posts are effective. So if somebody didn't comment on it, one, why didn't they comment on it? So then I start looking at what was the image that I used? How did I ask the question? Is this a question that people feel comfortable answering in a public forum where other people might see their answers. So like, for example, I did a post about like, what are issues that you have with your tenants for women who own land? Well, they're not going to post on Facebook because their tenant might be their like grandson and like they don't want them to see it. <laughs> um, and then I would also look at like, what time of day did I post? I might look at like last month when I posted similar posts and if they did well or not. And this is the kind of stuff that it takes time to do it, but it, the idea is that you have kind of a plan for when you're gonna do it, and you set aside that like hour, and it's worth it because 
let's say that I have decided I'm going to dedicate like eight hours a month to online marketing, it's worth it to take that one hour out of it to make sure that what I'm doing is actually effective and then I'm testing these things. Another thing I didn't talk about with email is A-B testing. So here you can run A-B tests so you can test your subject lines are effective by running a test. It will send it out to like a small portion of your email list and then you can see which uh, subject line was most effective and then you can pick which one is the best and then send it out to the rest of your list through that. Mm -hmm. And I would really recommend doing A-B tests. So like, especially if we're sending out regular emails, we often have a tendency to put in like form name newsletter and like it might say the same thing every month. And then when we see something like that, we know that it's something that we get every month. And so the sense of urgency might not be there unless we are like actively waiting for this information. So you might t do a test where you might say, okay, in this month I'm gonna try saying to some people, I'm gonna have farm name newsletter. And then another one I might say um, something about a specific product that I'm talking about or like something I learned and having that be the subject line, how can I like create a sense of urgency to actually get them to open the email? So that's another way that we can use analytics to make sure that what we're doing is effective or as effective as we can be in the moment. Um, other, other questions about tracking, data, how to know if what we're doing is effective. And I know I'm like, with the email the platform, it makes a difference. So I use a completely different platform from what I've used in the past and it's very clunky. And so I can't really show you what I do because you will never have to do what I do. <laughs> but um, if you go to the like, the support section, there will be lots of information about how to read the analytics on your email provider. Um, but yeah, taking the time to actually make sure what you're doing is effective. It's like the easiest thing to stop doing and it's the most important thing to keep doing. Um, okay, and now, so one of the other questions that came up is like, okay, I can get traction maybe with producer, other producers and like we're all kind of contributing to this greater narrative of being young farmers and like whatever, but like the audience that I, like consumers that I wanna reach, they're, May, they might like think that those posts are pretty and stuff, but like how can I actually get them to like find me? Um, so one thing that I use is Canva.com. Does anybody use Canva? So Canva is a really awesome tool. Um, it's recommend it because it's one of the easiest ways to just make things look a little bit more professional and it's pretty easy to figure out how to use it and you can create templates so that you're not making things over and over and over again and this is going to save you time there's a free version of canva and there's a paid version i use the paid version and it's $120 a year or about $12 a month, but the um, the free version is also very good, but you just have to be aware that they're going to charge you for some of the things, so you have to kind of pay attention to what you're picking, but you can... Um, create a profile and like have your same images, have your uh, colors picked out um, that you use um, for your brand and you can have the fonts that you use with your brand picked out and you get the idea. So what's the audience difference here? You talked a little bit about the difference between the Facebook and Instagram and so Canva is a tool that you this use to create a content. Media platform. It's just building. Oh, like a graphic design. Yeah. yeah. So this is like 
I would come in here to Canva and I might pick this social media post template. Just go there. And then eventually it'll come up and it comes up with like the exact size that you need it to be. So like if I want to make a Facebook cover photo for my Facebook page, it'll have the exact size. So I'm not spending time Googling what size is a Facebook cover photo supposed to be or making a Facebook cover photo and then it looks like garbage because I didn't do it right. <laughs> and like that happens. It happens to me too. Um, they have templates in here. You can see that they say if they're free templates um, and if they aren't, then it's usually a dollar. Um, and here, farm to table. They have just different elements, so I can just take this. Just, it's a drag and drop tool. And Internet Explorer, maybe not the best browser. We can avoid it, but <laughs> here we are together using it. Um, <laughs> and you can see, you can just highlight the text, change the color. Boom. And I've got pictures uploaded here. I want to, here's my people at my farm to table dinner. This is probably going to be maybe a little blurry, but you know, we want to have like our images the right size and everything. But you get the idea kind of, of like how you use Canva. It's a drag and drop tool. So this is a way that you can create Facebook posts. You can create you can create one thing and then you can save it and you can share it to Facebook and you can share it to Instagram, um, whatever platforms you're trying to use. Like I would maybe even put this in the top of an email that I would send out. Like I'm making one thing and I'm using it across everything. And this is gonna look, I mean, not this example specifically maybe, but this is going to look a lot better than if I had just posted the picture it's going to be easier for people to know like immediately what the message of what I'm trying to say is. How do you use Canva? I use it for everything. Everything. Yep. Uh, if we do any ads on Facebook or Instagram, I'll make them in there. I use it for our uh, any marketing material posters or anything like that um, for our email lists. And I mean, yeah, I my can I've been using it for a number of years. I've got probably hundreds of not more yep. different things sitting in there that I've used. So. And then you can go, so let's say that you're gonna take some time and you might make some stuff in Canva this year. You can go back next year and you might just slightly tweak that thing and download it again. And you've just, you've got it saved already. What's really handy, especially for me, since uh, I don't farm full time, <laughs> I can, I mean, it's on, it's cloud-based, it's all online, so you can use it on a whole different machine and you don't have to worry about, oh, I don't have the file with me or anything like that, it's just all <coughs> online yeah. and ready to go, it's really handy. Yeah, and like in my situation, I my laptop got stolen and I, I have Adobe Creative Cloud, but I had tons of stuff saved in Canva, and I just pull it up on my browser, and all of that stuff is still there. I don't have to spend a bunch of time re-downloading everything. It's just saved. I, I've been using Canva for years, too. The pre, uh, like, where it has the Facebook, those are so handy, because then you don't have to worry about, you know, even if I'm uh, just going to post a picture sometimes, and I want to make sure it's going to not get shrunk or something, right. I'll throw it into Canva on one of these just to resize the photo so that I know that when it goes to Instagram or Facebook or our Facebook cover shot or something, it's going to fit exactly. Mm -hmm. And the other great thing about Canva then is like, let's say that I'm planning a farm to table event. I made my Instagram. This is going to go up on Instagram, let's say. I can copy and paste that and then I'm going to make a Facebook event for it. <laughs> this will load eventually, but basically you get the idea. I can just take what I made, paste it in here, resize it, and we got a Facebook event cover photo now. Um, 
eventually, not in Internet Explorer, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, here we go. So you can copy and paste. You can see that's like the size that it was. And then I could come in here and resize it and make it look all pretty, but you've just got, you know, these few little things that you need to make these posts and you can you can get inspiration. There's lots of different fun, like graphic elements in here. Um, you can spend a lot of time in Canva, but you don't have to spend a lot of time in Canva. And it's not expensive. It's very, yeah, easy to learn how to use it. I'm not a graphic designer and <coughs> Canva really um, just made things like look a little bit more advanced and uh, professional. So, and I've, it's been really fun to see producers, okay, whatever. Um, it's been really fun to see producers like using it and getting really creative with it and making really awesome posts and like developing their brand over a course of a period of time just like using this tool. Um, and Do you have an app that you use it off your phone then? No? You can do it on your phone. You have yeah. To then go. There is another app that you can use on your phone. It's not as good. And I can't think of what. I know how you said you'll do like some of the running your pictures through it sometimes before just posting them. And I know like, I do it. Yeah, um, a lot of, like, if I go for my phone, I'll just go into the app and then shoot it to the app itself and then you can make those out of that one. But like if I'm um, doing a, text overlay or something on a photo or something and then I'll put it back into Canva okay. to resize it and then upload it off the computer. Yeah, I use, so I'll often like make something in Canva. I like to post, I post to Instagram and Facebook off of my phone almost primarily. That's how I do it even for our Facebook business page. Um, <laughs> but what I do is I make it, download the JPEG, send it to myself in a Facebook message, and then I open it up in the Messenger app, download it right to my phone from there, and then I've got it. Um, and then I have it in Facebook Messenger in case I delete it off my phone later and I need it again. Um, so highly recommend using Canva. I just think it's the best tool. It's like one of the best resources for all of us in this room who have to make things but aren't like graphic designers. Um, so then, just kind of, I have a few more slides and then we can do some more work time. But, uh, so if you do like writing, um, it used to be really that like shorter posts were the preference and now it's kind of moving away from that towards like a thousand words to 2,500 words. Who wants to write a 2,500 word long post? <laughs> Not very many people probably. Um, so what I would focus on if you are interested in blogging is thinking about things that are going to be like evergreen content for you. So like a post where you're writing about like reasons why you love farming or reasons why you loved um, like growing up on a farm or things to expect from us like when you're purchasing like how to know about like buying meat in bulk and like what does that mean. Um, so just writing some like basic kind of blog posts that you can use over and over again. Um, and then another thing that you can do is like, let's say that I don't like to write, but I wanna have some blog content on my website. Um, I might make sure that the dates are not visible in the blog itself. Um, so that when people come, they don't see that like, I haven't actually written a blog post in seven months. But what they will see is like, maybe seven reasons I love farming, what you need to know if you're buying half a cow, um, and then I might have like, uh, oh, I might have uh, posts that are like seven things that our customer said like they love about buying from us or something like that. And then I'm not really writing. I'm just taking all of these testimonials and sticking them in a post with like some pretty pictures and maybe I made a graphic on Canva. Um, or I might say like, uh, I might ask, what are some resources that you 
like for finding local food recipes. Mm -hmm. So like people are asking me for recipes, I don't maybe want to spend a bunch of time writing recipes. So maybe I can ask my customers, where do you like to find recipes that you use with our product? And then I might create a blog post that's like seven places to get good recipes for like eating seasonally or something like that. And then once again, I'm not really writing a lot. I'm just kind of like making a post that has a bunch of links and like a little description of them. So it doesn't have to be hard stuff. Writing doesn't have to be like a really long, you know, telling your story. It can really just be about creating evergreen content um, that people will will want to read when they're coming to your website or stuff that you can just like repeatedly share on Facebook. Like if you haven't been posting in a while and you know like I need to post something on Facebook, then this is in your toolkit of things that you can just pull out and post right away. And then in a, if you do want to do blog posts, definitely you want to have images in it, at least one image. And then um, yeah, if you're going to like do a, des a Canva design and post that on Facebook, um, and Instagram, you can totally put that in your blog post. And then um, the other thing you want to think about with blog posts is that you really want to have an image in there so that when you post to Facebook, it's not just posting that, like, the words, which no one's going to click probably. And so if you're blogging, you want to look for an area where you can pick, like, what the featured picture is. And this is going to look different depending on what platform you're in. But that's what Facebook will then pull from with the post. And this can get like complicated with fast because sometimes it's not really clear why Facebook is pulling this picture that is not the picture I want them to be mm -hmm. pulling. You can switch out the pictures sometimes depending on where you're posting from. So at the bottom, you'll see like there's a plus sign. Um, but basically, and I can show you some of that stuff too if people want me to get up here and show you how I use Facebook, but um, just I, I want you to make sure that you have an image if you're doing it. And then one thing I just always want to say is that I think that it's okay to be honest and that like there's lots of dark sides to farming and sometimes we shy away from that. Sometimes our audience isn't going to be really receptive of it, but I do think that there are a lot of opportunities to like show that you're a business and person of integrity by like being honest about some of the nuances of farming. And that kind of depends on what your voice is. And we're going back to voice, like some farmers are very political and they don't care that like, that might cut some customers out for them. And other people are gonna shy away from that. So that's just like a decision you kind of want to make for yourself, um, but I do think that, like, let's say that we have an Instagram, we have like a lot of producers following us and we might have some consumers following us. Maybe we're able to talk about like a negative thing that happened on our farm and we can have a conversation with other producers about that and then that's something that like consumers can see and learn from. And maybe that's not something that we wanna focus attention on. Um, but. I just put it in here because I think oftentimes people are afraid to do it and I've seen people do it beautifully. Like I've seen lots of producers in Iowa talk about, well, okay, I'm gonna give some examples. So um, Grinnell Heritage Farm had a pesticide drift incident. They were very vocal about it. Um, they ran into some problems with that too from the company side of things, but um, the people who follow them and like support them obviously really respected them for like bringing this bringing this issue to their attention, talking about it in an open way. Um, I know other producers that will talk openly about having anxiety and depression and the isolation that living in a rural community can have for them. And they're able to connect with consumers who might also struggle with that and it just kind of like humanizes them. Um, Dog Patch Urban Gardens in Des Moines just ran into an issue because the city was basically told them that they were within regulations and then came back and told them that they had to make like $65,000 in updates to their farm retail business that they like literally just built. And so they did a fundraising campaign where they talked very openly about what happened, what the story is. 
second they tried to raise, I think, $15,000, they met their goal very quickly. Um, so those kinds of things, like, I would, you can use them and you can use them to like, to your advantage and to, to help craft like this greater story. And then that's a really good way to get earned media too. Um, sometimes that can be, it can be hard to like get reporters to cover us sometimes. So talking honestly about things can sometimes draw attention from them. For newsletters, MailChimp would be the main platform that I would suggest. Constant Contact is another one. Small Farm Central has a bunch of tools. Um, they're based in Pennsylvania. They have like an email platform. They do, they have a text messaging platform. They have a website that has just like stock photos of vegetables and things like that. So they're a resource to check out if you're interested. Um, I would probably say MailChimp would be my email platform, but they are an option. And uh, it used to be, if you were a farmer's union member, you got a discount off of Small Farm Central's products. I'm not sure if you do anymore or not. I think you do. Um, like I said earlier, collect email addresses, even if you're not planning on opening, or if you're not planning on doing an email. We already talked about open rates and click-through rates. I definitely would say, yeah, collect emails. Even if you're not doing an email right now, I think you're probably gonna decide you wanna do one later. So for Instagram, your posts are only gonna be as good as the tags that you use. Um, so taking some time to make a list of relevant hashtags is a good idea. And I use a website called WriteTag to help me find hashtags that will be relevant. So like you could go to a WriteTag and you could type in tomato and it'll come up with all of the hashtags that are being used and you can see how many times they're being used. Um, and so then that can help you pick out things that are, like I said, the right level of specificity. So um, Farm Her, we talked about earlier, Mod Farm, Modern Farmer uh, Magazine, those are like pretty, um, well, they're very specific. They're like people who are following that, those magazines and reading them are gonna be using those hashtags. So I'm gonna get more traction from that than like if I'm using hashtag kitty, which is just like everybody who likes kitties on Instagram, which is like, what, half of the people? <laughs> so maybe not that one. It's gonna be, it's just gonna be harder for my posts to stand out in this like sea of posts that have this very non-specific hashtag of like kitty or chocolate or tomato or whatever. There's just like lots of people posting with that. Um, and then you can buy Facebook ads through Instagram and you don't actually have to have an Instagram account to put an ad on Instagram. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, farmers markets will often have hashtags. So that's something else that if you're selling at a market or if you're selling to a retailer that has a hashtag, you might wanna take advantage of those hashtags. Um, and so then with the hashtags, <laughs> This is where knowing your audience comes in. So you're asking this question about how do I get, I can like make the connections with other producers, like people who are doing something similar to what we're doing because we're using kind of like the same hashtags. So research is like a big part of it. So finding, you know, 10, 20 people who like you would maybe consider to be the audience that you're really trying to reach and looking at what kinds of hashtags they're using. And their hashtags that they're using might be something like weekend vibes. Iowa 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 sunset, things like that, that are not related to agriculture at all. Um, and you might say, on your Instagram, you might have like two pictures that are farm related, and then you might have one that's uh, about you taking time off to like go to a movie or something like that. And you can create that like feeling that then with your customers that they are following you as a person, like in addition to your farm business. So that's like a decision that you're kind of making about your brand and voice. Um, and like the level of comfort that you want to have there. But um, I think that on Instagram, we are really 
seeing that people with the story, like the story really encourages that. It's like, this is what I'm doing today. I got up, I went for a run. Now I'm out here doing this thing. Um, this, this idea that like we all want to know what everyone in our lives is up to all of the time, but it having the story to follow can help bring some of those non-farm people in and looking yeah just kind of like making it a comfortable sort of space like how are you sort of modeling that personal interaction on instagram so that's one thing that i would think about um using locate geo location so tagging the location and of your post when you're posting it and it doesn't necessarily have to be the location of your farm either like it could be a location that is near a grocery store that you think a lot of people in your audience might be going to and then if they're shopping in that area your post might come up as like a tagged location post post in this area um and then the other thing about hashtags is that kind of the um what the like the way of doing it now is to have the text of your post and then to put maybe 15 or so hashtags on the comment and I would probably aim for 10 15 ish hashtags um, and making a list and then just checking so we did this post we use these hashtags and did we get any new followers? Okay, over like a period of time, kind of assessing, I think that these hashtags are working really well and these hashtags are not, just based on the number of people that are coming to my profile after using them. Um, so that's a little bit about Instagram audience. Um, there's obviously a lot of people who have farms on Instagram, but there's also a lot of people that are cooking. So you might think about things that are more related to cooking. Um, yeah, other questions about Instagram. And we haven't even talked about Instagram stories, which is like a whole other, they don't really have, They you can put hashtags on Instagram stories, but it's not as, Okay, cool. All right, another thing that I always like to think about with Instagram is the way that like, my whole general profile looks. So when I worked at the Iowa Food Cooperative, I was talking about how like the circle was the big thing. So I would always try to make sure that we had kind of like lots of bright orange-ish circles on our profile so that like we were kind of keeping consistent with our brand without being like orange circle on every picture, but we are still kind of building this idea, keeping a mix of like close-up food pictures, pictures that have people in them. Some posts have text, not every post has text. Um, so that's one thing you want to think about with Instagram is just like, okay, I'm, this is the first time I've ever looked at this person's profile. What is this story telling me? And you can also show it to other people, you know, and ask them, like, what do you see? Like when you look at this Instagram profile, what are some of the things that pop out to you? Because what like your friends or family might see might be different from how you perceive what you're posting to. So asking for feedback is always a good idea, definitely on Instagram, where we have this like very visual representation of the story that we're telling without a lot of words. Oh, and I guess like kind of while we're here, so with Instagram stories, they show up in little circles um, down here, you can save them. So that's like one of the first things that people will see when they go to your profile. And then this, you would click on this to see what their most recent story is. So Instagram is like obviously really trying to make this a big focus of Instagram right now. I would say just from my personal experience, I get way more interaction using Instagram story than I do on my actual physical posts. You can use Instagram story to tell people that you posted something that you wanna make sure they don't miss because kind of like Facebook, we don't always see everything that gets posted on Instagram. Um, yeah, that's kind of the 
what I would say about Instagram stories. And so they're, the posts are up for 24 hours, but you can also save them into like highlights. And so then the highlights would be what would show up here. So I might have, I might spend some time putting together some recipes or I might do an Instagram story about like me making a meal with one of my products. And I might save that as a featured story then. Or like maybe for, healthy harvest you want to do like meat producers in the area and you're going to create a story that's got like all of these different producers um and then that's going to be like a featured story on your profile that you'll save and it's just called featured um text message alerts and okay so there's a free version of this called remind um we started implementing text message alerts when i worked at iowa food cooperative because like I said earlier, everybody's got their phone in front of them all of the time. Um, and so this is a really good way to like, just let people know what's happening in a quick text. So Remind is actually for like schools. Um, I think it's for like letting people know like if there's early outs and stuff like that. But you can make a list like up to a certain number of people and you can have your text message alerts and send them out if that makes sense for your business. Um, you said that was free? Remind, I think is free, yeah. Um, and then I've used mobile text alerts, which is about $35 a month, um, based on the number of subs subscribers that you have, and that made a lot of sense for the co-op. Um, this is something where like, you're probably not really gonna be thinking a lot about algorithms, well, you won't be thinking about algorithms at all, uh, at all. You know that like you're getting to your customer exactly where they're at, because you know that they're on their phone. Um, so you might collect phone numbers in addition to email addresses and you might ask people if they want to receive text message alerts from you. This is another thing where like collecting the, con collecting the data now to help ourselves later is never a bad idea. You know, never know when you might need phone numbers, so. All right, so this is kind of like the general idea about creating a marketing strategy is like these are some of the questions that you need to think about. So who am I trying to reach and where am I gonna find them? So that's my audience. My listing, how do I appear on the internet and how will people find me on the internet and how will they like perceive that when they see it? The content, do I like the creating content? If I don't like creating content, how can I start making content that I'm, it's gonna be more enjoyable for me so I'm gonna stick with this a little bit more? Um, and then what is the content that like my audience is most gonna wanna see from me? What is my voice as a farmer? And what is my business's voice? And then like, what is, makes my farm unique or interesting? So what are like the aspects of my personality? What are the aspects of like the practices that we're using? What are the aspects of the product mix that makes it interesting? Um, and you kind of add all of these things up and that's what creates this like overarching strategy. And I think that's the last. All right, okay, and so then a few other things that I like to use. One is Buffer, which allows you to schedule content across multiple platforms. Um, and so one thing that I might do if I have like a really busy week is I might just load a bunch of posts up into Buffer and then not think about them. So Buffer will allow you to say like, on Tuesday and Thursday, I want you to push out these posts and I want them to go out on Facebook Instagram and Twitter um, and then it allows you to edit the content directly in buffer to like make it look appropriate for each platform and then it'll actually schedule that out for you so rather than having to remember to post every day I can say Sunday nights I'm gonna take an hour and I'm gonna load up my buffer feed and I'm just gonna let buffer do the work for me during the week when I'm busy um, bit.ly or tiny URL allows you to make a short trackable link. So you can use those to see if people are clicking on your link. So like, let's say that I'm not using MailChimp, maybe I'm using Gmail and I'm just gonna send out a list, an email, cause I only have 30 people on my list and this is too much work for me. I could use bit.ly or tiny URL to see how many people clicked on a link I put in my Gmail email that I sent out. And then I was talking about Small, Small Farm Central. In my opinion, one of the best resources they have is this 47 tips and tricks for CSA farm marketing. But it's like CSA farm marketing, but it has lots of really good ideas just in general about things that people are doing with marketing. 
and then Pixabay and Pexels, they have free, um, no attribution required images. I've used them a lot for getting pictures of produce when I haven't had good pictures of produce. Obviously, like the red tomato might not necessarily look like your red tomato, but throw some text over it and it's gonna get the point across at least for today until I have a better picture of a tomato to use. Um, so those are some of the tools that I use in addition to Canva to just kind of like make my process more streamlined. Um, and then I use like Google Drive a lot. I use, you know, just like things Facebook Messenger, like you can use all of these tools to help you like keep track of your content too. And then kind of these, this is my personal opinion, but things that I would do or not do. So I would definitely have a simple and effective website that is at least a parking spot for people to find your out about your business. I would have a Facebook page that has like regular, it doesn't have to be every day, but just like making sure that if somebody finds our Facebook page, it looks like this is still a business that is operating and open. Um, and making shareable content so that it's easy for my customers to spread the word about me. I would have a marketing strategy on paper that has content ideas for every month so that if I get on track, it's really easy for me to get back on track. Um, and that I'm keep always keeping in mind who I'm talking to, what my voice is, and really focusing on what makes my farm unique. And then not feeling like you have to do everything and be everywhere. You don't have to be on every platform. You can pick this year, you're gonna focus a lot of energy on this, and maybe two years from now, you're gonna focus some energy on something else. And then don't be afraid to ask for help from you know, resources like Healthy Harvest, me, um and uh and your friends and like fellow producers and talking to each other like we were over lunch about what you're learning and what you're seeing and what you're figuring out so that's what i have in terms of like real actual presentation and so now i've kind of done this a little differently than what i would normally do but i want to just kind of have the opportunity for people to work on their plan and I would like to kind of get a sense of what everyone's thinking they want to do when they leave here so I can kind of help troubleshoot um, and then if people just have general questions that we haven't covered still. So.